it looks like it's time to get started here. So first of all, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for today's webinar. We are presenting today on the first part of our Amazon Vendor Strategy Series on increasing sales and maximizing profitability through the hybrid model. My name is Dina Podner and I'm the Marketing Manager at Marketplace Strategy. Marketplace Strategy is a strategic marketplace sales acceleration agency serving clients from startups to Fortune 50 companies. We manage more than 125 million in Amazon revenue in a variety of categories, from grocery to personal care to home improvement, electronics, furniture, and many more. Our team includes strategists, designers, writers, and advertising specialists trained and focused exclusively on Amazon sales. Just a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. For if any reason today you have to step away or miss a portion of the webinar, the entire <coughs> session recording and slide deck will be sent up as a follow up sent out as a follow-up along with the vendor versus seller calculator that will be mentioned during the presentation. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the question box in your GoToWebinar control panel. I'll bring them up during the question and answer portion at the very end. Presenting today will be two of our lead strategists, Sam Jennings and Curtis Rummel. They have both leveraged and successfully managed many hybrid models for many market many of Marketplace Strategy's largest clients. To give you an idea of the agenda for today, we're going to try to keep it to 45 minutes to respect everyone's time, but we're gonna start with a basic overview of Vendor Central and Seller Central, and then move into the marketing uh, portion of the pl platforms, and then go over the cost analysis between the two. And then we'll get to the bulk of the presentation and discuss the challenges and actions of the hybrid model strategies and end it with questions. Now, without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Curtis to get started. Perfect. Thanks, Dina. So before we jump into the Seller Central versus Vendor Central and the benefits of the hybrid model, uh, we first just wanted to highlight a couple of specific challenges that we regularly see in different scenarios that a lot of you are probably encountering right now. Um, so some of them, such as Amazon proposing unrealistic term increases, cost increases, uh, requesting for funding, or you know Amazon looking for lower costs, Amazon having ASINs crap out unexpectedly, ongoing confusing chargebacks, Amazon just not ordering enough in general, and just extremely slow product launches. So these are just some of the pain points that we've seen and have been able to successfully resolve utilizing the, the hybrid model and some of the different strategies that we'll go through in a, in a few slides here. So marketplace strategy defines the hybrid model as a strategic approach to Amazon, which consists of employing both vendor central and seller central to maximize sales, profitability, and versatility on the channel. So in general, we're going to be focusing here on why a brand that is currently on Vendor Central should and would utilize Seller Central for increased profit um, and just some of the specific examples that we've seen. So to get started, I'm going to switch it over to Sam, and he's going to provide a quick high-level overview of Amazon, the ecosystem, and kind of how everything here fits together. Great. Hi, everybody. So um, to get things started, I just wanted to preface kind of the first half of the webinar um, and just say that some of these explanations may already be somewhat familiar to you. Um, and really the goal of it is to get into the meat of it, which is really the strategies of the hybrid model. But to understand those strategies, you really have to have a, a solid understanding and foundation of uh, Vendor Central and Seller Central and the different options you have. So the first thing that we're gonna go over here, which is on this slide is kind of a diagram of all of the, the different fulfillment options that you have on Vendor Central and Seller Central. So on the left here, we have Vendor Central. Um, we have the two routes, one being purchase orders, which is a very traditional retail model, and most of you are probably familiar with this. And then we also have direct fulfillment. And then on the Seller Central side, we have fulfillment by Amazon and fulfillment by Merchant. So in the coming slides, we're gonna dive uh, much, much deeper into these different pieces, but it's kind of good visually to really understand the full ecosystem of Amazon and all the different ways that you can fulfill your products. Another a very important point as we go forward is just to really understand too that the goal of this presentation is not to um, compare Seller Central and Vendor Central and almost like match them up as competitors. Um, really what we want you to keep in mind is that the benefits of each platform can be accomplished through the hybrid model and any negatives that we call out can be um, alleviated also by the hybrid model. Perfect. 
<clears throat> so now we're just going to jump into a quick introduction of the different platforms and some of the different jargon uh, you might be familiar with. So <clears throat> on the vendor central side, this is when Amazon retail is purchasing the product directly from the brand and selling it directly to the end consumer. So <clears throat> the brand is paid upfront as Amazon takes ownership of the product. And typically um, those payment terms could be anything from net 10 all the way to net 60, depending on your agreement. Some of the different acronyms that you know could be called for the vendor central side are 1P, direct, retail, or vendor. On the seller central side, this is when the brand is selling directly to the end consumer. Um, the brand is then paid uh, when a product is sold. So basically they're getting paid based on consignment and it's essentially net 14 payment terms. Um, this is also known as a 3P, seller, or merchant. So now jumping in <clears throat> to the platform and some of the different relationships that you would expect within each. So on the vendor central side, uh, as everybody knows, you know, Vendor Central is heavily reliant on the case ticket system and working directly with RBS, so the retail business service team, to basically get anything on Amazon uh, completed. So whether that's fixing specific bullet points or that's, you know, making sure an image got uploaded correctly or just kind of resolving different kind of NIS new item uh, uploads and different difficulties with that. You may or may not have contact with a buyer or vendor manager, really depending on kind of your size relative to the, the, the high level category that you're in inside of Vendor Central. Um, and Vendor Central it is really trying to be much more self-service <clears throat> as it moves forward. Um, you know, as of right now, having to submit a ticket for everything just isn't really sustainable. And they have proven that they're really focusing on this and really building out kind of more self-service models. You know, one of the examples would be the most recent kind of update to the image upload system and just managing what images are currently live for each ASIN um, <clears throat> and just an easier kind of what you see is what you get model for uh, uploading new product images. So they're definitely working towards this. On the seller central side, the platform was 99% was built up basically with the primary goal of being able to accomplish everything directly as a self-service model. So everything from launching a new product to uploading images, to uploading content, to up updating any specific aspect inside of Seller Central was built to service, you know, the millions and millions of sellers that utilize Seller Central on a daily basis. So there is also the case system and different various support teams <clears throat> that you can utilize to basically get things accomplished, uh, such as the FBA team for different fulfillment issues, the captive team, the catalog team. So everybody is really specialized with very specific roles that can kind of help you get, you know, specific things accomplished um, just on the Seller Central side there. Also, the, the sales and customer data inside of Seller Central is, is really, really great in com being compared to the Vendor Central side. So in Seller Central, you get free access to, you know, the business reports in Seller Central, which include <clears throat> the exact number of unique visitors, as well as the exact number of page views, as just two quick examples, uh, on an ASIN by ASIN basis for any customized time frame. And this is really valuable because it's really the only place in Amazon where you can get very specific data on the traffic numbers that are going to each of your listings. <clears throat> so it's a really great thing to utilize and, and we'll go into that a little bit later and towards the end of the presentation on how we would actually utilize that data. But just quickly comparing that to the, the vendor central data side of you know, basic uh, ARA, which is basically you would only be able to receive you know, how many units you ship over a set time period um, and that's really the, the, the most valuable thing you get in Vendor Central um, and then jumping into the premium ARA side is when you get a little bit more of that more valuable data such as kind of geographic sales uh, you know what products another person purchased when they purchased your own product however that comes at a really you know it comes at a cost of you know somewhere between you know fifty to seventy thousand dollars per year to get access to that data so, you know, it's really nice to be able to utilize Seller Central as a platform to get that very defined exact data so that we can use this for kind of different strategies, you know, in the pipeline. Okay, great. So jumping into the different fulfillment options. So this slide is going to um, basically mirror the diagram that we looked at earlier that showed all the different fulfillment options that a brand has through the two different platforms. 
Um, so first looking at vendor central, um, the kind of traditional model that everyone is used to is the purchase order model. So this is where, you know, Amazon has all of their algorithms that are really forecasting um, demand by consumers for each individual ASIN. And kind of based on that demand that they're forecasting, they're going to place purchase orders for your products um, to meet that demand. Um, there's also the direct fulfillment option. So this is actually where the brand um, and Vendor Central can ship a product um, directly from their warehouse to the end consumer. Um, and this is an option that uh, pretty much any vendor can employ. And, and not everyone has the ability to do that, but it is a, it's a strong option if you do have the ability. In Seller Central, you have two options as well. So fulfillment by Amazon is basically where the um, seller is going to decide how much inventory they want to ship into Amazon's warehouse. Um, and then they're they're essentially just um, they're renting storage within the Amazon warehouse. And then Amazon's handling the pick, pack, and ship just as like they would for uh, Vendor Central. Um, and then on the fulfillment by merchant side, FBM, this is where the seller is going to be shipping the product directly to the end consumer. Um, and so if you were look at, looking at these apples to apples, um, you would really compare from a logistics and an operational standpoint, the purchase order model um, of Vendor Central to FBA on Seller Central, and you would compare uh, direct fulfillment on Vendor Central to fulfilled by merchant on Seller Central. Great. So kind of going off of that, we want to get into, um, you know, the prime badges and prime designation. So this is obviously a very, very important uh, consideration when looking at all your different options. Um, you know, tons of consumers buy only prime products. Um, it really boosts conversion rates and has a huge impact on sales. So on Vendor Central, every method that you can use for fulfillment, POs and direct fulfillment, um, are going to show that prime badge in the search results and on your listing. Um, <clears throat> the only caveat here is that if you are using direct fulfillment, the product page is going to say usually ships within you know two to three days or three to five days um, and those amount of days are going to update based on your warehouse's ability to ship that product to the end consumer in a timely manner um, so this if you kind of think about it from a consumer standpoint you go to a page normally it says two-day shipping but it actually reads usually ships within three to five days this could potentially hurt conversion rates um, it still has the prime badge which is great but just um, a small consideration there on the seller central side FBA fulfillment by Amazon is always going to be prime. And that's just because Amazon again is handling the shipping of that product so that they're able to put the prime badge on it. FBM <clears throat> is not prime. So um, because the, the brand is shipping uh, from seller central to uh, the end consumer, this one does not have the prime badge. The only way that you can get it is if you're enrolled in the seller fulfilled prime program. Um, this is a very specialized program that seller central, you know, rolled out over the past couple of years where um, if you meet very stringent shipping requirements um, and are able to ship within kind of the two day time frame for your FBM orders, you can actually get prime on your um, listings, even if you are shipping to the end consumer. So that's also an option. So when comparing all of these, you know, all these methods together, you know, the goal is to get prime. So if you do have the ability to ship directly from your warehouse to the end consumer, we definitely recommend direct fulfillment just because in Vendor Central, direct fulfillment does provide you with that prime badge. Great. So now looking at the inventory management side of both platforms. <clears throat> So vendor, in Vendor Central, Amazon handles all inventory forecasting, they handle all inventory management, uh, and it's really a much more of a set it and forget it model, whereas once the product is set up and it's get, getting purchased, um, Amazon pretty much handles everything from that point on. You know, the vendor also has, you know, minimal, most of the time has minimal influence over PO timing, uh, the frequency of those POs, and the actual order quantity of specific ASINs. Obviously, if you have you know, a better, more developed relationship with, with your vendor manager, you can kind of get these to be updated a little bit more and have a little bit more influence. But for the most part, um, we would say that it's not necessarily a good thing to rely on. On the seller central side, the seller is ultimately responsible for all forecasting of product inventory and, and future prospective sales, as well as managing the current inventory levels that are currently in uh, FBA at any given time. So the seller is 100% in charge of initiating the FBA shipments into, F, into the FBA fulfillment centers, uh, as well as completing the entire uh, shipment process based on your forecasts and your desired weeks of coverage. So there's a couple of different ways that you could look at it here. <clears throat> you could prefer to send in more frequent shipments into FBA. So maybe on a, a two to four week basis, you just would prefer to send it in more often with 
lower inventory amounts, um, but basically providing a higher sell-through percentage. Or you could go the route where you know you send a bulk amount in on an on a every two to three month basis because you would prefer to have you know less uh, overall shipments into Amazon and you would just kind of prefer that route. So that the overall desired weekly coverage really depends on your internal preferences there. But on a high level, Seller Central just requires you know significantly more energy and attention to make sure that you're not stocking out of products because. It is 100% your responsibility, and you know there's really no one, you know, like in Vendor Central, there's no one really holding your hand to make sure that you know you're getting all the necessary inventory in uh, at the right amount of time, and and you know addressing the necessary lead times for each shipment. So now going into pricing of each model. So in Vendor Central, uh, as everybody knows, Amazon controls the retail price and will fluctuate it basically wherever they want it to go. Um, that could be significantly above or below your MAP or MSL, MSRP price uh, with a couple different goals in mind. So it could be because they absolutely want to win the buy box the you know 100% of the time on that specific ASIN. It could be due to them price matching other third-party sellers that are also on that listing. Um, it could be due to price matching other online retailers to make sure that Amazon always has the lowest price or is matched at the lowest lowest price on the web. Um, also to consider for optimizing for sales. So if they know in a specific time period or based on you know current supply and demand that you know fluctuating a price would generate in you know higher profitability for them or higher sales velocity, they are completely willing and you know ready to do that as well. <clears throat> also, it's important to note that for the most for the most part, Amazon, unless you have a specific relationship with Amazon, uh, Amazon does not follow MAP, so it's just another kind of piece to, to always be considering. On the seller central side, a really key benefit here is that the seller has con has full control over the price, and you can essentially update it at any time. Uh, as long as you have a 15 minute notice, you can have your new up to date price live on Amazon um, very very quickly. And this is really a, a big benefit that you know brands that are constantly dealing with with channel conflict and your other retailers coming to you and saying, you know, why is Amazon uh, pricing the product at you know 30% less than my actual cost? And your reply to them being that you know they they price it to whatever they want. Um, so this just provides another lever that you can consistently be pulling to make sure that you know your price is set where you want it to be. Um, also, if you wanted to use this as kind of a visibility to other retailers, basically telling them that hey, we are enforcing our map, uh, we are you know valuing your relationship. So it's just another piece to to definitely consider here. All right. So last but not least, when controlling Vendor Central and Seller Central there's a lot of considerations um, kind of in the marketing realm. So um, although these products are sold on the same website, uh, Vendor Central and Seller Central have very different capabilities and offerings from a marketing standpoint. You know, these are ever changing. If, you, if we would have done this presentation six months ago, um, this would have been a completely different slide. So it's really important to kind of stay up to date on this stuff and really understand the, the core differences between the channels. So the first thing we're going to look at is promotion. So on Vendor Central, you know, everyone's familiar with the, the lightning deals, the deal of the day, all of those different offerings that you have um, access to. On Seller Central, you only have access to lightning deals, and they have to actually be recommended by Amazon in order for you to use them. So that's one, one key difference. Um, from a coupon standpoint, um, on Vendor Central, the coupons look a little bit different. They actually display in the search results, which can be very strong from a click-through rate standpoint to get people to go to your page. And then also, obviously, from a conversion rate standpoint, once they're on their page to actually purchase the product uh, using that coupon. On Seller Central, the coupons are a little bit different. They don't show up in the search engine result pages. Um, but you do have some more versatility. You can do interesting things like cross-selling products or, you know, buy two of this product, get the third one free. A lot of different kind of cool things there if you're trying to expand um, kind of the share of wallet. From an advertising standpoint, um, it's almost um, exactly the same on Seller Central and Vendor Central. Um, the only thing that is different is Seller Central does not have access to product display ads, which are, you know, the ads that show up um, uh, within the product pages um, and you can kind of control where those show up. So that is one difference um, from an advertising standpoint. 
and then from looking at enhanced content. So Vendor Central offers A plus pages. You know, over in the recent months, they've rolled this out as a completely free tool for um, all vendors to leverage uh, across their whole catalog, which is really amazing um, and definitely something that we recommend leveraging. Um, something that they've hinted that is coming down the line for all vendors will be premium A plus content. So this is something that they've kind of only released as a beta to a handful of kind of higher level vendors. Um, that's going to include things like video content and um, more engaging um, dynamic content. On the Seller Central side, there is something called enhanced brand content. So um, although it's called something different, it's almost the exact same thing as an A-plus page. Um, the modules that you can use are slightly different, but it appears in the same place on the product page, and it really um, accomplishes the goal of branding that page and driving conversion rates. Uh, that's also a free, a free tool as well. Um, as far as gaining reviews, um, Vendor Central offers the Vine program, which comparatively is a little bit more costly. Uh, Seller Central offers something called the Early Reviewers Program. Again, this is a pretty new thing that uh, Seller Central has come out with um, probably in the past six months or so, uh, where you enroll your product and um, you basically pay $60 for up to five reviews, which is a pretty great deal and something that's extremely vital when launching new products. Um, and then two kind of areas that are a little bit different on Vendor Central and Seller Central. On Vendor Central, you do have the access to, or the ability to upload detail page videos, uh, which again is a very, very helpful thing from a conversion rate standpoint. Um, on Seller Central, we think that that's probably coming down the pipeline very soon. They've kind of hinted at it at a few places in the platform, but right now it's not available to everyone. Um, on Seller Central, you can actually communicate with the customer post-purchase. Uh, because we actually own the product, we're able to have that kind of one-on-one -on -one communication. Um, so through some third-party tools, you can actually email a customer after they've purchased. Um, there's a lot of different strategies that you can employ here, whether it be just making sure that they had a great experience with the product, asking them to review the product, um, or even potentially providing them more information about your company, which is um, a, a really interesting thing to be able to do. And then lastly, we have some additional programs on the Vendor Central side. So things like Prime Now, um, the sampling program, the pantry program. Um, these programs are something that Amazon is pushing very heavily. Um, and if you're in the correct category that is associated with these different programs, it can be a really strong way to get your products in front of consumers that may not already know about you. Um, so definitely something to consider on that end. And then on Seller Central, as Curtis had mentioned earlier, there are stronger detail page analytics um, on the seller side. So this can be really, really great from the standpoint of understanding what's driving conversion rates, you know, what content, what images are working better, um, and then making and really informing your strategy to get better and better. Awesome. Okay, so that was kind of the comparison of Vendor Central and Seller Central and the many, many different considerations. Um, the next very important uh, vital piece is to understand from a cost standpoint, how do we compare these two channels together and how would a brand go about understanding profitability of Seller Central versus Vendor Central? <clears throat> so the first thing we're going to look at here is the Vendor Central uh, cost breakdown. So this is probably pretty familiar to our vendors out there. Um, these numbers that we have in here are just, you know, kind of average numbers that we see um, from a lot of our vendors. Um, but just note that the total percentage can range anywhere from 10 all the way up to we've seen, you know, 30, 35 percent. So um, these numbers range really based on, you know, your category, um, whoever uh, negotiated your contract when you first got on Vendor Central, if they didn't do a great job, you might have been starting at a, a worse point or even really just how much Amazon has kind of tried to uh, take more and more points over the years, uh, which is sad but true. Um, so the three things that are kind of the main pieces here that everyone's going to be uh, familiar with is co-op, freight, and damage allowance. Um, those are the three biggest percentages. You also sometimes can attribute some cost to chargebacks. That really just depends on your account and what you're experiencing there. And then there's also the terms discount fee. So all of those percentages are taken off of the cost price or the wholesale price. So on the other side, looking at Seller Central, we have a pretty different cost structure. So um, the first thing to know is that there is a referral fee of 15% taken, taken off of every single order, um, and it's actually a 15% taken off of the retail price of that product. Um, so that's the biggest piece. The next two pieces, the monthly storage fee and the fulfillment fee, um, these are other uh, fees that are taken based on the size and the weight of the product. So essentially how much room are you taking up in that fulfillment center when your product is sitting there? And then also how much, um, how heavy it is and what is the size when Amazon actually has to pick, pack and ship it to that end consumer. So those are two fees 
that are kind of variable. You also have the fee to ship it to Amazon, so basically your your freight fee. Um, and this just depends on you know how big your shipment is. If you're you know shipping a shoebox of products versus you know shipping five pallets worth of product, um, you're going to have a different cost there. But overall, it's a pretty minimal fee. Great. Okay, so to kind of bring that to life um, and really illustrate those different costs and um, kind of how you would look at it for your own for your own products, we have a couple examples here um, that are going to show the cost of a product on Vendor Central versus the cost of a product on Seller Central. Um, so in this specific instance, um, on the right here, you can see the selling price to the customer is $17.99. So it's an $18 product. Um, on the left, you can see that Amazon is paying the vendor $3.55 um, per unit as like a wholesale or a cost price. So Amazon's making a pretty good margin on this. I'm sure they enjoy selling it. Um, off of that 355, you know, you take all of your different percentages. In this specific case, I have at the bottom there, um, the, the terms in total are 30%, which is on the higher end, but you know, by no means unreasonable uh, or out of what we've kind of seen. And the total uh, net revenue of this product on Vendor Central is $2.50. So that's the Vendor Central side for this ASIN. Um, so now if you look at that exact same product on the Seller Central side, um, you'll see that Amazon takes the referral fee of $2.70, which is that 15% referral fee we mentioned. They also take the three different fulfillment fees, so the storage, um, the FBA uh, fulfillment fee, and then the ship to Amazon cost. And overall, the net revenue from the Seller Central side is $9.57. So we're talking about a $7 difference per unit, and you can imagine – uh, what that would be like if you sold, you know, a thousand units a month or five thousand units a month. It's a pretty big difference. Um, so I would say that this is kind of um, a pretty extreme example. Um, the next one that we'll jump into is a little bit different. Um, we're talking about a more mid mid price point here. If you look on the right there, we have the selling price to the consumer of twenty nine ninety eight. And if you look on the left, Amazon is paying the vendor eighteen dollars and sixty one cents for each unit of this product. So um, not not completely out of the question, that makes a lot of sense. The total net revenue on Vendor Central is $14.89, which is uh, really, really strong. And I do have noted at the bottom there that this vendor specifically has about a total of 20% in terms. On the right side, looking at Seller Central uh, compared to that, we have the $4.50 for the referral fee, all of the different fulfillment fees with a net revenue of $20, $21.78. So the margin is, again, quite a bit higher on Seller Central. There are instances where you may compare this and just depending on the size and the weight of your product, it might actually be more profitable to sell it on Vendor Central. Um, we aren't necessarily saying that every single instance is gonna be more profitable on Seller Central, but it's important to kind of look at this um, and really understand the cost of your products. Um, one thing to mention is that we will be sending this out um, as a follow-up email just so everyone can understand this calculator and kind of use it for their own purpose um, so that they can really analyze you know, their, their catalog. Okay, perfect. So now we're going to jump into kind of the five different reasons that we've laid out on why you should consider util utilizing a hybrid model strategy. So the first reason is to control and maximize profitability. So the two challenges that, you know, most of our clients are seeing right now are items are becoming less and less profitable on an ongoing basis inside of Vendor Central and the costs of doing business inside of Vendor Central are rising whether that's through the new terms that they're trying to essentially you know, double or increase significantly, or they're just not allowing increased product costs, even though your manufacturing costs may be going up. Um, also, the other challenge being that vendor chargebacks are really a recurring theme that we're seeing across the board, and they are really becoming a, a growing cost as Amazon tries to be much more strict and specific on exactly the requirements they require for you to send in uh, inventory and products into them. <clears throat> Overall, we do see Seller Central being a much more profitable channel, um, and but it really does depend on dimensions of the product like Sam talked about and just the high level cost of the product. Um, you know, you'll see some themes where products in the, the lower price point range, like the under $10, the under $15 uh, really do, you know, struggle sometimes with the profitability in FBA. Um, but in the, in the same instance, there could be some that just due to the dimensions make perfect sense. Some of the recommended actions that we had for this were to go, really go through your entire catalog and understand the profitability of each ASIN in your catalog. So, you know, 
you're going to you're going to find that you know somewhere between 50 and 80 percent of your catalog really are much more profitable on seller central taking all the, the costs into into consideration um com really compared to vendor central but then you're still going to have the, you know the 20 to 30 percent in vendor central that just make perfect sense because the fba costs on those items are just are just too high so really go through each of those and understand you know which makes more sense to really inform your plan of action and then also just as an immediate next step to that understanding the products that are less profitable on vendor central or products that have consistently high chargeback rates and begin to move those over you know one by one over to the seller central side if you're willing to kind of make a test here We've had a lot of clients that have successfully moved over anywhere between 30 and 50% of their catalog um, and have immediately seen an increase in their bottom line, um, especially as the evolution of Amazon continues. You know, in the, in the, the past years, it was always about um, how can we, you know, grow top line uh, sales. And now it's really flipping much more over to the side of, okay, we really need to figure out the profitability of this channel because other than that, it's not really making sense. So this has been a really, really great tool um also i mean a couple of just different examples is that some of our clients have found you know just three specific crap items uh that we'll go into in the next slide that basically were not profitable for amazon but on the seller central side they were immediately profitable so we'll just jump into that here so the next reason why you would really want to consider the hybrid model is to overcome pricing and different crap issues so crap just means uh, in, internal to Amazon that they can't realize a profit. So it's basically their internal saying for unprofitable items moving forward. So the challenge is here that you know Amazon has a continued focus on profitability in 2018 and moving forward, and you know it's really playing out with with terms and, and different things that we're seeing on not allowing you know some of the updates that need to happen happen. Um, also, Amazon is continuing to fluctuate their price point. So whether that's trying to match different third-party listings uh, on Amazon to make sure that they're winning the buy box, or that's all the way to price matching other retail websites. So other websites like Walmart and Target, and that, as these other brands you know, have a in really increased focus on uh, e-commerce moving forward to, to really compete with Amazon, it's causing really a lot of price, match, price matching issues. Uh, and the hybrid model and Seller Central really allow us to kind of get around these. Some of the recommended actions that we have for this to really understand, you know, what of your what I, items of your catalog are becoming crap or crapping out, or are in, the, in the, the process of currently crapping out. So one of the specific examples was to look at your fast track buy box percentage. Uh, so you can find this under the fast track in stock report in Vendor Central, and basically it's just a specific metric that details your buy box ownership um, on specific ASINs, and it allows you to kind of identify what ASINs may or may not have been turned off due to overall profitability of those specific products. So some other leading indicators of uh, kind of knowing that you know an item is in the process of crapping out would be you know if you're constantly seeing cost decrease requests from Amazon you're seeing different funding requests come through, or you're seeing different products being turned off in AMS due to financial ineligibility. So uh, a lot of, you know, seeing, you know, what's happening with these, with these products can, can lead to the next part of the strategy and the recommended action. The next part is to continue to evaluate those crapped out ASINs and see if it makes sense to move those ASINs over to Seller Central kind of one by one. Um, you know, a lot of the a lot of the instances that we're seeing with items that are capping out are they're just not profitable to Amazon because Amazon has very strict requirements that they need to be the the lowest price on the web or they need to at least match it. So if they can't be the lowest price on the web, it's almost as if they don't want to you know sell it long term. So you know, a lot of the times the price matching is causing the crapping out. Where if you just move this over to Seller Central, it could be an immediately profitable product. Yeah. So one example that um, kind of kind of speaks to this more is one of our one of our personal care clients um, in 2017 had two very very strong performing products that were probably generating I would say probably 40 to 50 percent of the total sales. 
Um, so those products were doing extremely well. In January, we started to know notice like a, a big drop off with with one of those products specifically. Um, and upon doing some more research, Curtis mentioned the fast track buy box is kind of how we found out about that as well as some of the other leading indicators of crap items. Um, we were able to identify that that ASIN was actually being price matched to another retailer online. Um, and we actually very quickly were able to create a seller central account to alleviate this issue. We were able to move the product over to FBA and immediately regain those sales in a, a pretty quick manner, actually. I mean, it's something that as long as Walmart or the other retailer would have continued to have that low price, Amazon, like Curtis said, would have never been able to really sell that product. Um, so by moving it to FBA, we were able to kind of make up that ground that we were losing out on. Great. And then the third reason why you'd really want to utilize the hybrid strategy is that to address a couple of these different challenges. So Amazon just frequently does not order enough of high velocity items. And you could probably have a, a much better sense of this in your catalog if you're saying that you know, every time you spot check specific ASINs that you know Amazon is either fluctuating the price or it says you know may take an extra few days or um, just different kind of other signals actually on the live detail page. So and stocking out is really one of the, the primary Amazon cardinal sins. And it's one of the easiest ways to kill a future kind of the, a listing's future growth and sales because it's all about momentum on Amazon. So, I mean, some of the specific examples that would kind of run into this would be, you know, products with unstable supply chains, uh, products that are very, have very high seasonality that focus a lot on Q4 or Q1. Um, and just in general, if you have products that you know are going to be running off Amazon promotion, um, and, you know, Amazon's not going to be aware that, you know, you are expecting an increase in demand and an increase in just overall traffic to those listings. So, you know, kind of leads into the recommended action of really utilizing an FBA safety net strategy. So basically having Seller Central FBA set up as a backup so that if you expect or it's a common occurrence with Amazon that they're consistently running out of stock or they're not uh, basically planning for the expectation that sales will increase in the future, it's just a really valuable thing to provide on the Seller Central side to make sure that we're not we're never stocking out. And Amazon, I mean, as everybody says, you know, Amazon is a virtuous cycle. And anytime you have a disruption in a nascent's momentum on, you know, a specific listing, it can definitely impact your short and long-term sales. So any chance we can to kind of just completely get rid of this, this issue um, is definitely a, a core win on the Amazon side. So um, a couple of our clients, you know, have have peak seasons that are in Q4 and, or even just in Q1 during, you know, the Lent time period or summer products. And Amazon historically has not done a, a, a good job of planning for those increased time periods. So utilizing the FBA safety net strategy as a way to prepare for those peak time periods to make sure that we're absolutely not losing out on those sales when everybody wants to buy. So just kind of a core example there. Um, also, just in general for seasonality, kind of falling along the same line, you know, if, in, if leading up to Q4, you know that you're going to be launching, you know, a brand new product in Q3, but Amazon doesn't have the historical sales data to support, you know, uh, increased POs of that product, you know, it may be a great strategy to just make sure that we have that, you know, the FBA safety net as a backup there. Okay, awesome. So jumping into uh, the fourth point here, which is really just being able to access additional marketing and troubleshooting tools. So this is kind of a twofold point, uh, the marketing side as well as um, troubleshooting issues within, uh, within Amazon. So the, the main challenge here, which is actually probably to most people just kind of an unknown challenge, is the fact that by only selling on the Vendor Central platform, uh, brands are really not maximizing their full sales potential because they really only have access to the marketing tools that are on Vendor Central and not Seller Central. So um, that's a huge, huge missed, missed opportunity that um, we could really be leveraging the benefits of Vendor Central as well as Seller Central from a marketing standpoint. Um, the other thing that we've hit on quite a bit already is just the lack of sales insights on Vendor Central. So especially if you don't have ARA premium, um, you really don't have a whole lot of data that helps you to inform your marketing strategy. So utilizing Seller Central is a, a huge win there as well. The last piece here, which is kind of more on the troubleshooting side, um, is the fact that 
vendors generally have much less control over third-party listing content. So let's say, you know, we're selling a one pack of our product and another third party is selling a two pack. We are not able to merge those products together. So if that third party is, you know, showing an incorrect image that they took with their cell phone or, you know, showing some type of uh, title that's incorrect and um, misrepresenting the brand, it's very hard in Vendor Central to take control over that third party listing and change the content. And that's something that we can actually uh, fix through Seller Central. So the main actions here are pretty pretty straightforward. Um, the idea is, you know, once we get that Seller Central account going, um, really making sure that we're accessing and utilizing the additional marketing tools. So, you know, utilizing the early reviewers program, um, the additional additional cross sell coupons to kind of, um, you know, show show different customers what other products you have in your catalog that they might not know about, um, and really utilizing all those tools to the fullest to accelerate sales for your ASINs. Um, and then on the troubleshooting side you know, being able to, one, take advantage of kind of ownership of third-party listing content is really huge. So that's extremely important from kind of a, a brand ownership standpoint. And then two, having more specialized support. Um, Curtis mentioned earlier, there's very specialized teams at Amazon Seller Central that deal with very specific issues that you can kind of access to get things done in a quicker manner. All right, and naturally kind of segueing into new product launches. So. The biggest challenge here, which I, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, whether you're launching you know, one specific product or a product extension um, where you're coming out with a new line um, of different products, um, it's always a huge pain point to get those products launched successfully on Vendor Central. So usually the process goes, you know, it takes you a week or two weeks to actually create that ASIN and have Amazon accept it and kind of put it in your catalog. And then it can take another two weeks. It can take multiple months to receive that first purchase order. Um, this really, really slows down the process, obviously, if you're waiting for them to take that first step to uh, place the PO. And that first PO um, is really just based on, you know, how they how they perceive that potential ASIN in the market and what they think the demand is going to be. Um, sometimes they're faster, sometimes they're slower. The other piece is if you're doing a really good job as a marketer to push that product um, in that initial launch phase, let's say you're running advertising towards that product, you're doing different coupons and promotions to really push it, there's a good chance that you're going to stock out because they did not order enough in the first place. Um, and as we mentioned, the sales velocity piece is very important. Um, if we're stocking out, we're slowing down our sales velocity and really just slowing down the overall success of that potential product on Amazon. So um, the action here is to launch products on Seller Central. Um, this is something that we do um, with quite a few of our largest clients where basically we take a product that's launching, we start it on Seller Central, we ensure that we have you know, two to three months of expected coverage in FBA of the inventory of that product to make sure that um, we're not gonna stock out whatsoever. And then we're utilizing all the additional tools that we have, um, like the early reviewers program and the email marketing campaign and the different coupons to make sure that we are really doing all that we can to make a successful launch out of that program. Um, something that we get asked quite a bit is, oh, well, if you started out in Seller Central, can we move it over to Vendor Central? The answer is yes. Um, you, what you could do is basically wait till once you launched a product in Seller Central, let's say you get you know, 20 reviews and you have a pretty consistent sales velocity. Um, if you feel comfortable, you can move that product over to Vendor Central and kind of let Amazon retail take the reins and start purchasing your product um, on an ongoing basis. Awesome. So those are our five reasons why you would, as a vendor, employ the hybrid model um, and kind of different pain points and things that we're seeing on a daily basis that we know for a fact can really be um, alleviated through utilizing Seller Central um, and Vendor Central at the same time. So now the big question, what is the next step? So what is, what is the first thing that we can do to really get started? This is pretty straightforward. So we're gonna create a Seller Central account. Um, there's really no reason not to. Uh, we always get the question, you know, is, is Vendor Central going to get notified that we're creating a Seller Central account? Is our vendor manager going to notice um, that is not going to happen? There's no harm in creating this account. You know, it only takes like a couple of hours. It's very quick. Um, and then the great thing is, you know, as a marketer, um, you can kind of jump in there, play around, see how self-serve it is. I think you, um, all the people who have not really been exposed to the Seller Central platform yet will be pleasantly surprised by um, kind of all the different things you can do within the account. 
The next part is to really analyze your vendor central catalog to identify the best opportunities that you could potentially start with on seller central. So uh, we mentioned a few of these. The biggest things that we would do is really take the top 20% of your catalog, like uh, the products that are really driving the most sales, understand from a foundational standpoint, which products are going to be more, um, much more profitable on seller central and potentially think about moving those over. Um, you could also conduct a crap or a out of stock analysis to understand if there's just, revenue being left on the table because Amazon's not, Amazon's not purchasing the product or there's frequent stockouts. And those are just immediate quick ones where you can take that revenue over to Seller Central. And then also the third one, uh, just being any upcoming product launches that you have in the future, where basically you can just test out one or two on Seller Central, really get that sales velocity going, control the inventory, and then potentially move it back to Vendor Central if that's the preference. So another big piece here is to make sure that you're always applying for brand registry. So this is a this is something that Amazon's putting a huge focus on. Uh, we're at, we've actually been working pretty closely with the brand registry team at Amazon um, to make sure that we're doing kind of the best practices for our brands. And one thing that's very important to note is that even if you have brand registry on Vendor Central, you want to make sure that you also have that for any brands that you're selling on Seller Central. Um, brand registry is kind of acting as that central hub between the two platforms. Um, and you just want to make sure from a content standpoint, from a brand ownership standpoint, that you have both of those, um, you have brand registry covered. All right, and then the last piece that we always recommend is just a crawl, walk, run approach. Um, a lot of questions that we get are always about, um, you know, do I have to move my whole catalog over? This sounds, you know, really intimidating. What, ha what if this happens? What if that happens? Um, what we always say is, you know, try it out with a couple products, whether it be a crap product that you're currently not able to sell in Vendor Central, or it's something that's very unprofitable for you to sell. You know, give that a go and see how it goes. See how it affects your team internally um, from a from an operational standpoint, and then just kind of ramp it up as you become more and more comfortable with it and really understand the nuances. All righty. Well, it looks like we've come up here on our 45 minute mark that we promised, but um, we're going to get to these questions. So if anyone has to jump off, that is okay. We will be sending out the slide deck and the recording and a follow up email, like we said. Um, but we're going to get to these questions right now. Let's see here. All right. So the first question that we had asked here in a few different ways is Will my buyer be mad? Hmm. Yeah. So we give this question all the time. Um, so the Seller Central and Vendor Central teams may as well be completely different companies. So it is somewhat of a gray area that they don't really want you moving over because it's just kind of lost revenue for them. Um, however, you know, if a product craps out on Vendor Central, then there definitely isn't an issue to sell it on Seller Central. However, it's really the products that, you know, have it crapped out that you may potentially want to move over to uh, Seller Central that could potentially be the issue. Um, however, just on a high level, um, I would just recommend not letting your vendor manager know that you're kind of evaluating this opportunity um, just to be safe and to see how everything kind of progresses here. Um, however, that with that being said, 70% um, of our clients, roughly, you know, large and small, are utilizing the hybrid model in some shape or form, uh, and we have never seen an issue. And you know, we, we've seen some clients that if they were to accept their 2018 terms, then they would immediately be unprofitable. So you know, we also view this as you know, it's it's an absolute necessary thing to have as a backup because you know Amazon's going to do whatever is best for them at any given time, whether that's you know doubling your terms or not allowing you to increase your costs. So you just also need to be prepared to do what is best for your brand in the long run. You know, really utilizing Amazon as a channel. All right, perfect, thanks. The next question here is, can I move my ASINs back to Vendor Central if I move them to Seller Central? Yeah, so um, so definitely, you 100% you can move ASINs back and forth. Um, the really important thing to remember is that every product on Amazon is tied to that ASIN identifier. Um, so whether it's on Vendor Central or Seller Central, you're always gonna have those reviews that are tied to the ASIN and the sales velocity. So moving them back and forth isn't really gonna hurt anything. Um, what we tell people is if there's any issues uh, when you move something over to Seller Central, it can very easily be uh, pushed back to the other side. So definitely no worries there. Perfect, thanks. What about product returns in Seller Central? Yes, so product returns in Seller Central. So assuming you're utilizing fulfillment by Amazon, 
uh, Am uh, FBA will handle all product returns. So basically, all product returns and customer service. So say a, say a customer wants to return something back, they would just ship it directly back to FBA uh, and they would handle everything. Um, and then basically on an ongoing basis, you can request Amazon to return all of those returns back to you at 50 cents per unit, or you could just have them, you know, destroy the product. Uh, free returns happen, you know, regularly throughout the year. I think last year there was, you know, three different instances where um, they just basically said for the next week or two, if you, you know, want to have any products that are currently in FBA returned to you, um, you can absolutely go ahead and do that. So. You know, and, and that's in Amazon's best interest because they just need to get things out of their fulfillment centers because there's so much demand. So, yeah. All right. And the next question we have here, are the stronger detail page analytics better than ARA premium? Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, I, I guess it's kind of up to the person who's viewing it and kind of what they're using that data for. Um, in my opinion, the analytics on Seller Central are considerably better. Um, you're going to get straight um, information from a traffic standpoint, a conversion rate standpoint. Um, you get information on reviews, um, a lot of different interesting elements that you don't get on um, basic or premium. Um, and you also have the ability to look back in time quite a bit. Um, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, definitely. I think they also have different use cases. Um, so from the seller central side, you can basically you know see the exact traffic that are coming to those pages. So it really helps with an overall understanding of you know conversion rate on that page, which is something that you definitely don't get um, nearly as much of on the premium ARA side. So that's definitely a valuable thing. Um, also on the seller central side, it just makes it a lot better for overall a b testing uh, because you can basically know the exact day that a change went live and then you can see the exact before and the exact after uh traffic and conversion rate for that listing so it just allows you more, much more clear data whereas on the premium ara side there's just a lot of other opportunities that we can uh, utilize from like the geographic data side and you know customers who bought this also bought this so um they're definitely very complimentary. So anytime you can utilize them, you know, in tangent is definitely a win. Perfect, thank you. All right, let's see here. The next question is, how does brand registry work with the hybrid model? Yeah, great. So yeah, the, the brand registry team has only been around for about nine months and we have seen um, a lot of success directly with them kind of implementing and kind of removing counterfeits and just, you know, removing potential imagery that, you know, third party sellers that are copying um, kind of your brand reputation are using. So uh, we have been working with them quite a bit and, you know, the brand registry side is really just a, a, a middleman for all the different changes across across Amazon. So they are intending to be like a liaison between seller central and a liaison between vendor central so that there's basically one portal that you can make, you know, all of your requests and all of your changes in. So, um, you know, utilizing the hybrid model really wouldn't change it too much. Uh, if anything, it just kind of gives you a more central hub uh, to really kind of battle a lot of these issues that are going on. All right, perfect. The next question is, how does AMS work when switching from Vendor Central to Seller Central? Are brand pages owned only via Vendor Central? Yeah, definitely. So to answer the second part, brand pages um, can be utilized via Vendor Central or Seller Central. Um, so you can actually create them on either platform. Um, my recommendation would be if you already have it on Vendor Central, just continue to kind of run it through there. There would be no point in creating two separate uh, brand pages or stores as they're called now. Um, the other part of the question is how does AMS work when switching from Vendor Central to Seller Central? So what we like to do as a best practice is if a product is sold on Seller Central, let's make sure that we are advertising it through Seller Central. If the product is sold on Vendor Central, let's make sure that we're advertising it through Vendor Central. Um, the more you can separate those and kind of have clean data, the better. Um, one thing that we did mention in the webinar is that product display ads are not actually available on Seller Central but you can actually utilize PDAs or product display ads um, in Vendor Central AMS to advertise Seller Central products. So that's one area where you might have a little bit of overlap. Awesome, thanks. All right, the next question here is, under Seller Central, is the item listed as sold by the vendor shipped 
by the vendor regardless of fulfillment model or how does Amazon show it under both? Yeah, so in Vendor Central on the detail page, it's always it's always ships and sold by Amazon.com. So whether it's direct fulfillment in Vendor Central or it's um, just you know, by normal purchase orders in Vendor Central, it's always ships and sold by Amazon.com. With within Seller Central, it ends up showing up on the detail page as um, you know ships uh, sold by brand name and fulfilled by Amazon if you're using the FBA route. And then if you're using the FBM route fulfilled by merchant, then it would say sold by brand and are sold and shipped by brand. So it, just a little bit different, um, different ways of it, it eventually showing up. All right, thank you. Okay, and the next question we have here is, what are the options if we can't sell as consignment? Yeah, definitely. So. This is probably one of the biggest, I mean, this in addition to other tax considerations are kind of the two primary issues of, you know, why somebody, you know, maybe wouldn't be able to do the, you know, the hybrid model. Um, but in general, if you can't sell by consignment, it, it does get a little bit difficult to, um, you know, to utilize this model. One of the recommendations would be, and if you reach out to us, we can give you specific referrals, but I would consider utilizing you know, maybe a different, you know, third party logistics company. So like a 3PL um, to kind of assist with that um, kind of on the, the repacking and shipping in Amazon side, or just, you know, unfortunately you would have to kind of consider some sort of wholesale model for that, just to kind of get around the selling, selling based on consignment. So it does get a little bit more complicated um, if you aren't able to do that, but I mean, definitely reach out and we can, I mean, help as much as we can there. All right, perfect. Well, it looks like we're running out of time here. So thank you so much um, to everyone for joining us today. If you have any questions that we um, did not get to, we will answer um, them directly <clears throat> via email. And like I said, please keep an eye out for the follow-up email containing the presentation and the slide deck. Um, and if you have any further questions, here are Sam and Curtis's um, direct email addresses and they will get back to you as soon as possible. So thank you so much for joining us and have a great rest of your day.